Hello, my name is Ashish Mahabur. I'm the lead computational scientist at the Center for Data Driven Discovery and the ZTF ML lead. And I'm going to talk to you today about the tools for the ZTF source classification project, aka scope. So this is the broad overview of the short talk. I'll tell you very quickly about CTF survey. I'm sure you have been hearing a lot about it already, so I won't go into many details. Then the ZTF scope philosophy and the ML tools that we have been using with CTF scope. So this Wiki transient facility, as you know, uses the 1.2 meter automated telescope. It gathers about 1.4 terabytes of data every night and it catalogs billions of astronomical objects. It registers hundreds of thousands of events every night. A quick basic filtering is done and specialized filters are used depending on science use cases. What the SCOPE project aims to do is to classify all the objects using the archival data. So this is the very broad philosophy of SCOPE. We decide on a few classes that we need to classify objects into. Eventually, we want to get to all the classes, but we start with a few where we have large enough training samples because that is one of the main requirements. But then we decide the hierarchy because many times what happens is that some of the classes have subclasses and one may want to simply do classification at the higher level first and then get down to the subclassifications when there are enough examples for each of the subclasses. Otherwise, if you have unbalanced data sets, then the classifications that we get may be less reliable in some cases. That is where the training sample and active learning comes in. So you start with the training sample, you use the training sample to do early classifiers, then look at the output and then see whether you have representative cases and using active learning, then provide additional examples so that the training sample improves and then go on to do further classification. We mainly use two modes for these classifications, phenomenological classes and ontological classes. We'll go into a little bit of detail on these. And all the classifiers that we have been using are binary classifiers. So we'll mention again why that is so. And then meta classification is something that we'll be getting into. I have not done that yet. So this diagram indicates how we start from ZTF light curves and go on to do various aspects of scope. We have various external data, which we use in certain cases. Those are cross-matched with the data that we have. The external labels have been used for labeling initially, which form the training set. And then those are the ones that get used with phenomenological and ontological class classifiers. And those are the ones that lead to classification scores. The details of many of these things based on a 20 field study. In ZTF for the primary grade, we have over 600 fields. We pick 20 out of those to do the first paper and the details are given here. And as I said, what we do is that we use only binary classifiers. So when you have a large number of classes, sometimes the tendency is to take a few of those classes and use examples only from those classes to do classifiers. But because we are interested in classifying everything, it is quite critical that we be able to take one class and everything else to do the classification and then a second class and then everything else to do the classification. That way, if we are, when we get an arbitrary object, we are able to say more confidently whether it belongs to a given class or not, at least for the different classes that we have considered. So here are how the phenomenological classifiers look. Here we use only the ZTF data and these are not science defined classes. So they are based on how the data look. So whether an object is a variable or not, whether an object is periodic or not, whether the time scale seems to be a long one or not, whether the light curve is irregular and so on. And even here we can have some hierarchies. For instance, if we find an eclipsing light curve based on the eclipses that are say, not even for the alternate ones. Uh, within them, we can have the EA, EB, and EW classes, etc. Similarly, for the ontological classifiers, which are now more science-based classes, we have hierarchies. We see pulsators at the top, and within that, we have delta scuti, cepheids, RR lyrae. Even for the RR lyrae, there are subclasses. So these use both the ZTF data and external data. And among the external data, we use pan stars, which have multiple colors. Then we use Gaia, which have additional astrometric accuracy and all wise, which have infrared data. 
The light curves that we start with, there are many possible features that we can derive from them. The astronomical light curves are very irregular. The gaps are big. Sometimes there are annual gaps, for instance, when the star is in the direction of the sun, we don't see that at all. And using these irregular data, we can derive tens of different features. Here, for instance, there can be the median, there can be the mean, those are very standard ones, but then you can have skew, kurtosis, and you can leave out certain fractions and ask for various other uh, specific details. You can have the sticks and J and K that you see there, and you can ask for the standard deviation and what fraction of points are beyond the standard deviation and so on. So you take these tens of standard statistical descriptors. In addition to that, you can also have very well-defined specific ones for different kinds. For instance, a supernova is a single peak. So you can ask whether you see a single peak or a flare also can have a single peak, but which is much sharper. And using these, then they become the inputs for your classifier. So you create a data set, which has a large number of rows and large number of columns. And once curated, then you can do your business on those. So one of the other things that we do is also convert the light curves into image representation. So we can use something like deep learning CNNs. Here, for instance, what you see is you've got N points, and these are your points in the light curve. You can take a pair of points and see the delta time in them. The time is on the x-axis and on the y-axis there's brightness described as magnitudes. So for the two points, you take delta T and then the delta M on the y-axis. And then that translates to a single point in this figure, where now on the x-axis you've got delta T and on the y-axis you've got delta M. So for every pair of points in the light curve, you get a point here. And so if there are n points here, you've got roughly n square points here. And those then form a density, which can be converted into an image like this. So the rectangles here are deliberately of different sizes because you have more observations with smaller delta magnitudes. That is why you've got smaller delta magnitudes here, whereas there are fewer objects with greater delta magnitude. So here you've got larger bits. Similarly, over shorter time, you can find more variations, or at least those are the ones that you are interested in. So for larger periods, then you have got single rectangles. But these uneven rectangles are converted into same size pixels here. And then these form inputs to deep learning later on. This is the active learning part that I mentioned earlier. Once you have a trained data set, you can use that to classify some of your objects and then display those objects to see whether your classifications are correct or you can randomly display some other data and see whether they belong to specific classes. So what you see here is a light curve. You Again, there is T on the x-axis and magnitude on the y-axis. This is after folding them on the period that you have found it with. And so you can see it is more regular. And that is how you can see that the phase here goes from zero to two. So zero to one is one and the same is shown a second time there. And what this area allows you to do is let the user define whether it's a variable or not. So you can use these sliders to put it at zero, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75 or one. Same thing, is it a variable or not? And these are, of course, matched to each other, then periodic or not. And within periodic, does it look like a sinusoidal or not? Or is it more like sawtooth, et cetera? So you've got several different bits that you can set. And those then become part of the classification process. So some of the classifiers that we have used are XGBoost and DNN. In XGBoost, this is an advanced form of um, decision tree which is backed and boosted and so on. So single decision tree, what it'll do is that it'll take all your columns and all your rows and figure out from the columns which of the variables are best to separate data on. And then it'll march down the line to get a classification. What happens with a decision tree is that a single variable sometimes can be a strong separator of data, in which case that separator is going to appear at the top of the curve at the top of the tree, and it'll give you, in some sense, a biased classification, especially if you have two classes that are unbalanced. One class has more objects and another class has fewer objects. Then such a classifier with a strong separator will not be giving you good results. And so that is why random forests are introduced, where random forests take a subset of columns and subset of rows, but many different types of subsets for each so that 
a good fraction of those smaller trees will not have your strong separator. And then you aggregate them, you bag them together to get good results. With XGBoost, you take that one step further. These are gradient boosted tree classifiers and the real value tree outputs can be added together to build higher level structures. The trees are grown gradually, but in a greedy growth based on purity and loss minimization. So you have a loss function and you try to minimize the loss as with any other machine learning thing. And with the separations that you're going to do, you try to have as pure samples as possible. And then you take random subsets of data and features used per iteration, just like in random forests. The hyperparameters that go with XGBoost are uh, listed here. You look at max depth of your trees, which determines how complex your trees can be. You determine the minimal, minimal child weight, which determines the partitions that you can have. Then subsample is the fraction of columns that you can have. And sorry, subsample is the fraction of rows that you can have. And cold sample is the subset of fractions, subset of columns that you can have, the fraction of columns that you can have. Similarly, then there is the learning rate, which is standard in machine learning. And then there's a scale pause weight for balance. Again, I mentioned that if uh, you have unbalanced number of objects in different classes, then many classifiers don't work well. XGBoost generally works well with those two. But in addition, you do have this variable if you want to deliberately say that one of the classes needs to be given a higher weight. The DNN is a more standard neural network. You see the feature vector, the different features we talked about from a light curve. Those are in a fully connected branch. And then they are concatenated with the feature map that comes from the convolutional branch, which operates on the DMDT. So again, remember that DMDT are the images that we created from light curve feature, light curves. And then those are given as input to the CNN and the output of that is connected with the fully connected branch from the feature vectors. This is how the details of the uh, network looks like the DNN. We can't go into more details. We don't have too much time, but it's a standard CNN. You can see that this has been cut into two parts because the network was fairly large linear. So you can see that the features start on the left-hand side and that part connects here. There is a dense layer through dropout, then you know another dense layer, and then that is concatenated with this bigger part, which comes from the DMDT. So this is the convolutional part. You have a separable convolutional 2D and another layer of that. And then you do max pooling on that dropout, another couple of pairs of separable convolutional 2D, more max pooling, more dropout, and then you do global average pooling and then concatenate that and a couple of dense layers to do the scoring after that. So this then is taking care of both the images com that come from the light curve and the features that come from the light curves and concatenating them to get the scores and the desires. We would wish to combine this in a higher level meta classifier also, but we have not reached that level yet, but that is one of the things that we'll be doing later. For XGBoost as well as DNN, it is quite important that do hyperparameter optimization and visualizations to make sure that the kind of data that you are getting makes sense. So you start with rule of thumb values, but you can also do a very broad, big grid search and then narrow down onto a region where things are good. So you will also use things like KL divergence to make sure that you are getting minimal uh, answers, uh, minimal optimized values that you need. You can also use Keras Tuner and AutoML. They are getting better and better to do the hyperparameter optimizations for you. And if you're using TensorBoard, then you can do lots of visualization to look at how your training goes on because that indicates whether there is overfitting or other pathologies that are coming in, et cetera. You make various confusion matrices, use different metrics. Don't use just accuracy because again, for unbalanced classes, and we have lots of them, accuracy can be very misleading. So use other things like Matthews coefficient, F1 score, et cetera. Do lots of visualization through histograms and horror seekers to make sure that you're getting things right. So that's what we go through. And then we use additional visualization through something like TSNE, which is a low dimension projection again of whatever you're having. It has its own hyperparameters. So one has to be careful with that. And there are other methods like UMAP, PacMap, uh, et cetera, that have been coming up that can be used in addition to that as well. 
So this is TSNI visualization on the left. You see just the variable, non-variable separation. And once you take out the non-variables, the variables that left, those are the 10 classes that are seen on the right-hand side. There's a summary that I would like to leave with you in this very short talk. So how we go about doing the classifications are that you decide on a few classes, their hierarchy, pick a training set for them. You need to have large enough training sets to be able to do the classifications. Then improve the training set through various types of active learning, labelings, etc. You classify, visualize, optimize, and repeat a few steps to do that. And that's how you can get good classifications. So thank you.